All right, we are live. So today I'm gonna to talk about model-based control design. And so the idea here is given a model, how do we find the associated controller that's ideal for that model? And I'll explain that in a second as we go through the math. It's actually not too complicated. And then I'll go through a series of examples and show how we can pull out different uh, PID control parameters given, given our process parameters, such as our gain or our time constant. All right. So let's take a look at the notes. And so basically, whoop, let's start up here. So again, here, we're gonna talk about model-based control design. And our goal is given our process transfer function, how do we find the associated controller? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the set point response. So here we have our set point going into our feedback loops, so our Ys coming back, we're comparing it, taking the difference between these two, that gives us our error signal, goes into our controller, then goes into our process and gives it, us our output. We can next calculate what the closed loop transfer function is. Again, it's the straight path, uh, CG, divided by one plus what's in the loop, which is again, one plus CG. And so we get Y is equal to GC, one plus GC times our set point. And so our, our approach is gonna be we're going to try to specify what the closed loop uh, response will be and then solve for the associated controller that gives us the desired response we want to kind of a set point change. So the idea here, slide back a little bit, is that we have our closed loop transfer function GC1 plus GC and we're going to set that equal to some arbitrary function T or arbitrary transfer function and this is our desired closed loop transfer function. I'll explain in a second what the form of this will be. But given this t, we know what g is, then we can solve for c. So we have one equation, one unknown, one unknown. So if we solve for c, we take the one plus gc and we multiply it by the t, and we get the equation gc is equal to one plus gc times t. We basically collect terms, we get gc times one minus t is equal to t, and then we get our final formula. And this is the formula we're going to use that our Controller C is equal to one over G T divided by one minus T. So this is the controller that will give us a closed loop response equal to the transfer function T. So again, the two things we need to know is we need to know our G, that comes from our process model, but what about T? And so I'll give you one example, which is a common version of T. And basically the idea here is we're gonna set our T, let me come back here, is equal to basically um, a first order system. So we have a first order response. To make sure that we have zero steady state offset, in other words, that we track our set point, we're gonna set the gain equal to one. So again, that means if we make a change in our set point, our output will match that uh, change because the gain is one. And then we're gonna specify how fast that response is, and that's our closed loop time constant tau of C. So that's really the tuning parameter here. And that's telling if it's big, that means we have a slow feedback controller. If it's small, it means we want a really fast feedback controller. So if I take this, I take our formula, C is equal to one over G times T, one minus T, and then I plug in for T. So T here is one over tau C, S plus one, and then one minus T, when I invert it, becomes tau C, S plus one over tau C, S. These two terms cancel out and I get our final formula, one over G, times one over tau CS. So this is a controller given G that'll give us a closed loop response with the time constant tau C and again, a gain of one. So in the remainder, what I'm gonna do is just go through different examples and show you what kind of controllers we get for different kinds of models. So our first example is gonna be just a first order system. So here we have G is equal to K over tau S plus one. This is a first order system and we've done this multiple times. And so then we can use our formula that C is one over G. So we just flip this around. So we get tau S plus one over K times one over tau C S. Again, tau C is our desired closed loop uh, time constant. If I factor this out, I get one over K tau over tau C times one plus one over tau S. And this, should form, this general form should look kind of familiar because if we look at the general form for a PI controller, so C of PI, let's emphasize the PI controller, that's equal to KC times the quantity one plus one over tau I S. And so then we can just match terms and figure out 
what's the controller? Well, KC, that's simply one over K, tau, tau, C. And then our integral time, tau of I, if I match terms, that's simply equal to tau. So basically what we're getting from this is that our optimal controller is a PI controller for a first order system. And so as I mentioned, we can tease out the tuning parameters. K of C is one over K, tau over tau C. And our integral time is equal to our process time constant. There is a nice little short uh, cut here. Let me slide back a little bit. And basically what we're saying here is if we decide to set our closed loop uh, time constant equal to our open loop time constant. So again, closed loop time constant equal to our open loop time constant. Then this formula simplifies down to simply that Kc is equal to one over K and tau I is equal to tau. And that's actually the tuning rule we used in the previous lecture. And this is actually the only tuning rule I expect you to memorize uh, because it's actually fairly convenient. Typically, you don't really care too much about the process time constant. You know, if our system takes an hour to equilibrate, you're pretty much happy if it's the closed loop system also takes an hour to equilibrate. And that just makes our life much easier in terms of simplifying down because basically we've eliminated the one free variable in the system. So let's do another example. Going to our next one. Whoop. So I've come here. This is going to be a little bit more complicated. And I come over here. And uh, let's clear this up. Uh, so now let's consider a second order system where we have k all over tau squared s squared plus 2 chi tau s plus 1. So here we're doing kind of the standard form for a second order system. And now if we use the formula, I have c is 1 over g. So I have k tau squared s squared plus 2 chi tau s plus 1 times our 1 over tau cs. Now I'm just going to factor out the k. So I have 1 over k times basically this expression, tau squared s squared plus 2 chi tau s plus 1 over tau cs. And then I can just start working out the terms, do a little bit of algebra, and I get this kind of expression, that I get this quantity, 1 over k, 2 tau chi over tau c, 1 plus 1 over 2 tau chi, 1 over s plus tau over 2 chi, S. And again, this should look somewhat familiar to us because if we go down to the general form for a controller, for a PID controller, it's just Kc 1 plus 1 over tau Is plus tau Ds. So again, this is the proportional term, this is the integral term, and this is a derivative term. And if we look at it, how I formulate it, I have a 1 here, a 1 here, I have a 1 over S, I have a 1 over S, I have an S, an S, and then we just match terms. So here's our Kc, here's our tau i term, and then here's our tau d term. And basically, I've summarized these results that kc is 1 over k, 2 tau chi over tau c, our tau i is equal to 2 tau chi, and our derivative time, tau of d, is just basically tau over 2 chi. And so that gives us, again, the optimal tuning rules for this that, again, will give us a first-order closed-loop response. And it also shows us that for a second-order system, a PID controller is basically the optimal controller for that. So let's do another simple example. So let's do a, an integrating system. So again, an integrating system has the form G is equal to K over S. Sometimes we just call this simply an integrator. And basically, again, the integrator system is simply a system that integrates the input. So think about a bathtub filling up, where you can think about the volume of the bathtub as the integral of the, basically the liquid flow into the bath tank. And these typically fall into level control problems. So if you think about level control on a tank, it's basically an integrating system. So in this case, I have my controller is equal to 1 over G, so I get S over K. And then I have, again, my 1 over tau CS. And then what's nice about this one is the S here and the S here cancels out. And basically, I get 1 over K tau C. And if we recall that for a proportional controller, basically, the form of it is um, simply k of c. That's a transfer function. It's just a static transfer function, no s. And we get our optimal tuning rule that kc is equal to 1 over k tau of c. So for an integrating system, our optimal controller is basically a, a proportional controller. Let's do one more example. So I think this one's cool because it emphasizes basically the fourth form of control you can get. So let's consider this system. 
G is equal to K over S tau S plus 1. And this is what's known as a servo system. And to emphasize what this is, typically these systems come up in robotics, so it's not that common in chemical engineering, but you know, if you're in packaging or in kind of batch processes, these kind of transfer functions can arise. So if we consider the unit step response for this, so we have U is equal to one over S, basically we're getting a response. You can think about this as a ramp response, as equivalent to a ramp response for a first order system, right? That S and that S become one over S squared, and that's a ramp. And so again, the ramp response is basically no response until we get to a time equal to the time constant, and then we go, uh, linear almost with a slope of k. Now, the way I think about these systems is in like, say, a conveyor belt. So I have a package on a conveyor belt. If I turn on the input to that package, basically maybe it'll start moving right and it'll continuously move right. So here's like, you can think of here's the lag for the system to kick on. And then if you think about this as the position of this box, right? basically that position is gonna keep on moving. So it'll keep on moving and eventually obviously it'll fall off, but you can go either way. So we could always move the package this way. So that's what I think about these systems. At least that's intuitively how I think about it. You could also think about it as a robotic arm. If I come back, my hand, like I turn on the motor and my hand starts moving. And then I turn it the other way, it kind of continuously moves. And obviously there's gonna be some kind of lag associated with that response. So in this case, again, our controller is one over G, right? So I got K S tau S plus one times my one over tau C S. I clean this up, right? I factor out the one over K. I get tau S squared plus S over tau C S. Start thing, seeing things cancel out. But when I factor this out, I get one over K tau C, one plus tau S. And if I consider a proportional derivative controller, um, again, these controllers are not very common in the chemical industry, but they are mechanical engineers use them a lot. And because again, if you think about a mechanical system like a conveyor belt, you know, it's basically keeps on moving one direction or moving the other direction. But the general form for a proportional derivative controller is we have the KC, we have the one, which is a proportional part, and then we have tau DS, this is the derivative part. So once again, we're just matching terms. So here's KC, here's the equivalent KC, right? One over K tau C, so that's my first expression. And then tau D is simply equal to tau, and I get my expression for my proportional derivative controller. So again, for this kind of system, a proportional derivative controller is kind of the ideal system for that, or ideal controller for that. And again, this is specifying the closed response. So last thing I wanna talk about is what about disturbances? So everything I've talked about is the set point response. And it's important to recognize that basically the principal job of a controller is to reject disturbances. So it's not often that like in a chemical plant operation, you're constantly changing the set point. You know, typically the set point is you're gonna be set. And what you're more worried about is rejecting disturbances. So again, in terms of the feedback controller, we have a Y set coming in, we have a disturbance coming in. So what I mean by this is that this Y set's not changing a lot, but this disturbance may be changing, right? The quality of our feedstock might be changing, the temperature, all kinds of things can be hitting the loop. Now I'm gonna make a simplification here. So if I take D, that goes into my D transfer function for the disturbance, and I'm gonna call this variable coming out of it D prime. And what that's gonna allow me to do is basically simplify this loop. So I have Y set coming into the loop, I have CG, and now I'm just gonna kind of collapse all this. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking all of this quantity right here, and I'm gonna collapse that into some D prime. Right, and I'm just gonna make that simple and that simplifies down the loop. And the reason why we wanna do this is often feedback control cannot account for this D directly. So even if we know the dynamics of the disturbance or how the disturbance hits the process, feedback alone can't account for this disturbance. And the reason why is if we look at this D transfer function, it's nowhere in the loop. It's actually outside of the loop. And the best way to think about it is some perturbation to the loop. And that's why I draw it like this. So this quantity in the orange box is basically a perturbation to this feedback loop. And if we actually want to account for this disturbance, we actually need to use feed forward control. And I'll talk, I'll talk about this probably in about two weeks, about the design of feed forward controller. But the nice thing about this 
kind of setup is it allows us just to focus on perturbations to the feedback loop. So we can think about disturbances. We have normal operation of our feedback loop, and these disturbances are basically perturbing the function of this feedback loop. So if we look at the closed loop transfer function for this system, we do the straight path, right? So I go D prime to Y. Well, there's nothing there, so that's simply one, right? And then I have my loop part, so I have one plus what's in the loop, and that's G and C. So that's my closed loop transfer function. And so we're gonna do the same approach as before. So this time we're gonna take this one plus GC and we're gonna set it equal to some T of D. And this is our desired closed loop disturbance rejection transfer function. And then I go through the math, I take this quantity multiplied by T of D, I get T of D, one plus GC is equal to one. And basically I get a formula that C is equal to one over G, one minus T of D all over TD. So it's kind of the same formula, except before we had T over one minus T. Now, let's give a transfer function for this. So what's a reasonable transfer function? So before we had one over tau C S plus one, and this time I'm gonna actually use a function that looks like tau C S all over tau C S plus one. And a big question is why? It might be useful to think about it, but the key thing is we need this S in the numerator. That's really important. And that S in the numerator is what's gonna enable us to have disturbance rejection. And the reason why I put tau C in the top and the bottom is to clean up the math. Well, if I do that and I go through all the math, basically I get C is equal to one over G times one over tau C S. And basically what's that saying is if we try to design our feedback controller based on disturbance rejection and we use this desired closed loop response, then basically we get the same formula as before. And so here's the same formula part. So it doesn't really matter, even though we focused before on set point, it basically gives us the same design for disturbance rejection. So the last thing I wanna talk about is, why did I choose this transfer function? T equals tau C S over tau C S plus one. So the first thing we might wanna do is what is the unit step response? So here we're gonna take a disturbance of one over S and we're gonna see how that disturbance, actually that's D prime in my notation. And so what I'm looking at here is Y is tau C S over tau C S plus one times one over S. Whenever you have an S in the numerator, you gotta worry about the initial value and we're also gonna worry about the final value. And so initial value theorem, what we're saying here is Y of t equals zero is basically the transfer function evaluated s equals infinity. And basically, if we do s equals infinity, this is just simply equal to one. And then the final value theorem, right, y at time equal infinity. Here we're just taking the transfer function and evaluating s equals zero, and here we get zero. So we know we're gonna start at one and end at zero. And so if we can sketch the disturbance rejection, so what's gonna happen is, so initially, before times less than zero, we're at zero. We're gonna jump up to one, and then we're gonna start and come back down. It's gonna be basically a first order response. So again, the response is always determined by the denominator polynomial. The numerator does not affect it, the shape of it at least. Um, and so we're gonna jump up to one and it's gonna come down. Actually crack that, the numerator can affect the response as I'll talk about in the next lecture. But in this case, we basically have a first order response. So we're gonna jump up to one and then it's gonna have a first order response down to zero. If we think about the two thirds to get to your final steady state, in this case, it becomes one third and that's gonna occur when our time is equal to our closed loop time constant. But the key thing is we have disturbance rejection because Y goes to zero as T goes to infinity. And to think about an alternate view, if you think about your process, it's at some steady state or at your set point, then a disturbance hits the system and that hits it immediately. So it jumps up and then we're gonna come back down and eventually decay back to our set point. So this means that the disturbance is rejected. So that's another view of the same graph. This would be in deviation variables and this would be in absolute variables. All right, so that's it. Um, basically, um, all my notes are, actually the write-up of this will be posted on Compass. If you have any questions, please put them in the comment section. If you have any suggestions, feel free to email me and stay safe. Um, the next lecture should come out Monday or Tuesday. All right, bye guys.